Action Man and its range of products is the most important section of the Palitoy line. We have recently been remodelling the figure with a view to improving various facets. These include cost reduction, better appearance, easier production, better functioning use. Throughout Action Man's 18 years on toy store shelves, the basic figure was continually evolving through a number of innovations, including realistic hair which arrived in 1970 and gripping hands that were introduced in 1973 with both of these innovations being developed by Palatoy. In 1976, new Action Man figures were released with moving eagle eyes, with this innovation being developed in the United States by Hasbro for their G.I. Joe Adventure Team figures. Yet the most drastic change arrived when Palatoy completely redesigned Action Man's body, introducing the dynamic physique in 1979. Prior to this, Action Man's body was the same as the product that was designed and patented by Hasbro for their G.I. Joe figures that were first released in 1964. And although these figures look great when the figure is dressed in a dashing uniform, the crude design was quite unsightly when the figure was shirtless or naked. Therefore, the introduction of Action Man's all-new dynamic physique met several business requirements. It satisfied the need for a new marketing feature every three years or so, it was a figure that was cheaper to produce, and it eliminated the metal rivets used on the older style body that were becoming a safety concern in the toy industry. Yet with all things Palatoy, there's a lot more to the story. So if you want to learn the history of how they created the dynamic physique, stay tuned. Come with me, toy fans. Hello Action Man fans, my name is Tony and welcome back to the Analog Toys YouTube channel, where we're obsessed with bringing you the true history of vintage toys and action figures. From 1966 onward, the body of Palatoy's Action Man figures remained the same, aside from innovations to his head and hands but by 1978 the design looked dated and unfinished. A new body design for Action Man was needed for several reasons, with the main one being that Palatoy's production tools were wearing out after 12 years of use, and the increasing number of defects were making the original body too expensive to produce. Present production is centred around two basic problems. Firstly, the injection moulding tools are family tools, and secondly, we use metal rivets to hold the product together, and these are rather unsightly. The new Action Man Dynamic Physique body would be a rare win-win situation for Palatoy, because in solving safety and production problems, they also designed a figure that was cheaper to produce and one that was far superior to the figure it replaced. The new figure, this is the Dynamic Physique figure, will be moulded on non-family tools which in addition to more efficient tool design will facilitate control of components in stock in equal quantities. This redesign not only improves our product appearance and functioning, it also gives us a saving which we estimate to be at least 10p on the factory cost of the product. GI Joe tooling that came out to the UK that we used to make the first figures on was a, what we call a family tool, so all the components were on one mould. And if, for instance, one of those components was out of specification or hadn't been moulded 100%, it meant that the, the actual full shot, all the plastic off the mould was scrap. Alec Langton was process manager at Palatoy at the time, so as well as liaising with manufacturing to ensure the smooth process of completed designs into production, he was also responsible for specifying materials and tooling requirements. Alec worked closely with Bob Breakin and Ivor Edmonds to ensure the efficacy of the design. He decided that the new figure should be moulded on a number of hot runner tools dedicated to individual components. For example, a four impression mould for just the lower leg. More expensive than the old family tooling, but in the long run more efficient and economic. In order to produce this new Action Man Dynamic Physique body, a huge amount of complex engineering was required. The design brief for this new figure had two critical aspects. The first was to create a design that eliminated the metal components, and the other was to ensure that the movement of the limbs was as near as possible to the human body, particularly in the sitting position. Bill Pugh, Palatoy's Director of Design Research and Development who delivered the design brief, felt very strongly about that. Initially, Bob Breakin employed a local model maker to sculpt a number of different concept models to work out the type of physique they were going for, as they had to ensure that Action Man looked fit and muscular, but not overly buff. Yet these were not exactly up to the standard required and were rejected. Bob Breakin and Ivor Edmund sat down together to brainstorm ideas of what the new design should be to satisfy the brief from Bill Pugh. Various schematic drawings were produced until Bob came up with the idea to hand assemble the arms and legs by pushing the components together as a unit before the final assembly of the figure. The basic idea was that the two flesh components of the leg, for instance, would have two components inside, 
somewhat like plastic bones, which attached to the foot and would click in place holding the whole leg unit together, and after assembly they could not be pulled apart. The same approach was used for the arms. This eliminated the need for riveting machines in the factory. One area where Bob and Ivor needed the most help was with the problematic hip joint, as this was key to maintaining the full posability goal that had been set by Bill Pugh. As always though, this was a team effort at Palatoy, and other people were co-opted to help out and offer ideas. All minds were put to the problem, and it was Palatoy's model maker Pete Mansell who solved this critical issue. A final schematic drawing was produced, which Alec Langton used to estimate tooling, moulding and assembly costs. These were presented to Bill Pugh, who then presented a justification to Managing Director Bob Simpson and the Marketing Department, and permission was given to proceed. The next stage was to produce a looks-like model, and Ivor Edmonds was tasked with doing this. Each individual component was sculpted by Ivor, and silicon rubber moulds were made from which resin components were taken and a complete non-working figure produced. This model was approved and then drawings were made of the bones, and resin tooling aids produced from the silicon rubber moulds. Before proceeding to produce the production tooling, the design had to be proved. The design department had a small Austin Allen injection moulding machine. Using the tooling aid, small individual moulds of each component were produced so that final working prototypes could be assembled in the department. Once the prototypes were approved, the decision to move forward with the production tooling was made. Roger Morrison, who had recently joined as tooling manager, would be given the tooling aids and drawings to take to the toolmakers. Process manager Alec Langton left Palatoy before the new dynamic physique figure went into production. John Hawkes joined Palatoy in 1978, moving into the process manager role while the team were in the middle of tooling for the new figure, and John recalls one aspect of the dynamic physique that disappointed some children. Prior to this time, when a child would send their broken action man to Palatoy, they would get it back after it was repaired, knowing that it was still their action man. Yet with the new dynamic physique, broken figures couldn't be easily repaired, so Palatoy would send them a brand new figure instead, and a lot of children were complaining, saying, I don't want a new one, I want my action man back. This reaction is testament to just how much British boys identified with Action Man, and it's the main reason why the toy was so successful for such a long period of time. In hindsight, Bob concedes that the final operation that assembled the figure should not have been sonic welding, but a screw in the middle of its back. The figure could have been easily disassembled and a broken leg would have been easily swapped out. Children would not have been so disappointed, and collectors today would be delighted. Some collectors today refer to the Dynamic Physique body as the Blue Pants Action Man, and this is because of the blue underwear that was moulded into the figure to hide his genitalia. However, as you can see here, early sales samples made from prototype tooling came with green pants, and some of these escaped into the outside world and have now become highly collectible rarities. Moulded into the waistband of the blue pants was a belt buckle that featured the Action Man logo, and in addition to the trademark scar on his right cheek, the new Dynamic Physique figure now also sported a small scar on his right bicep. When the new Action Man figures were ready for their retail launch in 1979, the Palatoy marketing department heavily advertised the Dynamic Physique. A large poster was created and displayed at Toy Fair, and the Palatoy trade catalogue devoted a full page to this new promotional feature, which even made mention of Action Man's new healthy-looking suntan. The new Dynamic Physique was also the focal point of what is arguably the best Action Man television advertisement ever made. As storm clouds gather over Mrs. Rogers' garden, the Action Man gang assemble for the big parade. It's an impressive display of military muscle. And speaking of muscle, just look at Action Man's new fully poseable physique. It's chest out and eyes right as the top brass take the salute. They know that whatever the task, Action Man with his dynamic new physique is ready for action. The new Dynamic Physique Action Man figures were supplied with an eye-catching new packaging style that featured a side flap, and 1979 would be the only year that Action Man was sold in a box with this addition. Yet the art style used on the box would continue for several years, and Palatoy referred to these as key figure boxes. I was asked by Ken Moore to, uh, to do some Action Man artwork. Yeah, I did that one, and all that, that range of key figure boxes. The new Dynamic Physique packaging was advertised on the bottom corner of each of these figure boxes, with added descriptions listed on large back panel artwork. Numerous different key figures were produced with the Dynamic Physique, including soldiers, basic figures, helicopter pilots, frogmen, SAS figures, and space rangers. Although my personal favourite is the Action Man Talking Commander, because 
My grandparents gifted me one of these for Christmas in the early 80s in one of these exact boxes. And once again, the legendary Dave Barnacle created the artwork for this box. When Palatoy produced the Dynamic Physique Talking Commander figures, the voice boxes were manufactured at a different factory. And this is one of the more unusual pieces in my collection. This is an actual Palatoy component carton that held 12 Talking Commander torsos. Although over the years, I have used a few of them to repair other figures. These voice boxes were supplied to the Palatoy factory already attached to one half of the torso, with the assembly held together with an elastic band ready for use on the production line. Where the regular Action Man Dynamic Physique figures had a sonic welded torso, the talking commanders were assembled with the arms, hip joint and neck post, and then screwed together. The legs were then put together at the factory on the assembly line before the entire body was locked in place when the thigh components were sonically welded together. As I said before, the action men as they went now the belts took up some interesting poses. Not only were the hands between the legs. <laughs> the eagle eye heads were moulded in two halves and then assembled once the moving eyes device was positioned inside the head. And then they were ready for a process known as flocking a process that applied Action Man's realistic hair. Very crude and basic. I mean, you just basically had a glorified bit of dowel with a, which had, you'd push the uh, head yeah. onto a little, like, metal plug. Mm -hmm. uh, Placed on a pegboard with a, an adhesive, an adhesive or something to attract the... Well, you the know, you, that was put on the end of the little yeah, one and you put cram. that in to the... Uh, yeah, cabinet. Cabinet, which was, and then the static adhered the, like the denier flock to it. Yeah. And then it was brought out to, to start to cure. And then they were pushed onto the uh, dry, if you want, the drying cabin. It was like a belt-driven thing. The heads were ready to go for manufacture. That was it crudely, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if uh, health and safety existed too much in those days. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the, the adhesive was very much like, I, I would describe it like an Evo stick type of material. Because the smell was terrible. Poxy wasn't it? resin, wasn't yeah. it? Sort of thing. And they were painted on, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. And that was done in a flow line, so if somebody was painting them on, like say putting them on a pegboard, and then they were put on this probe, and as John says, then they were put into the uh, into the like into static the cabinet. cabinet. Yeah. It was, I mean it was only a, like a chipboard yeah. thing with a bit of perspex right. with a little hole cut out. Yeah. There's a little recess to a bit, a bit like a rabbit hutch. Yeah. Yeah. And then the air would jump on, or you know, with the with the adventurer as yeah. well. Once the figure was fully assembled, Action Man would continue his journey down the production line, where he would be dressed and then finally packaged. As successful as the new Dynamic Physique body was, Palatoid did not rest on their laurels, and they introduced Action Man's fifth and final innovation in 1981. Of course, the other thing that came out of the Toy Fair as well on Action Man, a new thing on Action Man, was the sharpshooter position. By this time, John Hawkes had replaced Bill Pugh as design director, with Bill moving on to a new European role in Maidenhead. John had a young son who was frustrated that when he put his action man in the prone position, his head would not stay up to aim his rifle, he just looked into the ground. John moulded a small lump, or Adam's apple, onto the neck of action man's chest. When the head was pulled back, the neck post would click over the lump, keeping the head looking forward when the figure was lying prone. This was such a simple idea, and almost free. All the toolmaker had to do was grind out the lump in the mould cavity, but it gave the marketing department another feature to promote on packaging and adverts, keeping the brand moving forward. This is today's Action Man, watching the armoured jeep getting ready for action. Talking Commander gives his orders. Give me some cover. The assault copter fires off its rockets in support, right on target. But is the battle over? Only you know, you and Action Man. The Palatoy designers did have plans to present another additional feature to marketing to boost the brand. A gimmick called the Action Man Grimace was a feature where the lever would make the mouth move, but I'm glad this never came to fruition, as this is the stuff of nightmares. While certain Action Man enthusiasts tend to hone in on the blue moulded pants, they were the least significant element of the new Dynamic Physique body. From the consumer's perspective there were major advantages, such as stronger gripping hands, the pumped up physique meant that Action Man could be taken seriously as a competitor to other action figures on the market, 
and of course that glorious golden suntan. The redesign action, man, it meant that we could make smaller tools and more efficient injection moulding tools and the cost came down dramatically. You got a better figure, obviously with less cost. Back in 1975, Hasbro also introduced a new lifelike body for their G.I. Joe figures. But unlike the British design dynamic physique, G.I. Joe's new body was not an improvement on the original in engineering terms. It was merely a cosmetic makeover, and I believe it contributed to the demise of the 12-inch G.I. Joe line. On the other hand, Action Man's new physique increased his longevity, affording him continued success, even during the height of the Kenner Star Wars era. Action Man's dynamic physique was a monumental triumph in terms of toy design, and it's a travesty that we never got to see where Palatoy would take the figure next. Palatoy is Britain's biggest toy company. Three years ago, the firm announced a massive £74 million turnover and a four-year plan to consolidate their position. That plan ended in today's news, which has cut the workforce at Colville to less than half. The demise of the Colville operation began two years ago when production of the Action Man doll, popular for 18 years, was stopped. It left the workforce to carry out just assembly operations. Managing Director Peter Waterman said the redundancies were unavoidable. If it weren't for the ingenuity of Palatoy's engineers and designers, who did such an incredible job, Action Man's reign could have ended much earlier. But the introduction of the dynamic physique breathed new life into Britain's most beloved toy franchise and their achievements can never be overstated. So thank you all for watching, and if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to check out some of our other Vintage Action Man content, you can click the links up here. Or subscribe to the channel by clicking here, or consider supporting us on Patreon, where you'll get access to hours of exclusive content. I'm Tony from Analog Toys, and I'll see you in the next video.